first of all, Afridi is right. You're right. He's a mercurial player, but he's a bold and beautiful player. There's no doubt about that. He's also very popular. He's the sort of person we want to, in somebody in the selection committee who can take bold decisions, to, to experiment with new talent, um, to realize where old, uh, old is still gold. Uh, and I think that was missing in this team, which is why we've had four defeats in a row in the test matches. Our team is pretty good uh, on ODIs and uh, T20s especially because of PSL. But test match cricket seems to have waned in the last four years, um, <clears throat> not least because domestic cricket, which was the main source of test cricketers, because we have a three-day and a four-day competitions there, uh, playing, you know, uh, matches being played between eight to 16 teams. Uh, the Kaidi Azam Trophy and so on, um, that had been abolished. So I, th I thought Afridi would be the right man. He would agree to give us a green pitch, not a pitch on which you could play for a draw and not be defeated. I think the public wants to see results. They're not so concerned about winning or losing as they are about seeing exciting cricket. And the sort of pitches that uh, the previous selectors and the previous coaches were, or had required of our, our groundsmen were placid pitches. Uh, so that, you know, that we could play for a draw in, in the worst case situation. But as you could see, uh, even when we were playing for a draw, we barely managed it uh, in the last test. And whereas in the first three tests, we were whitewashed, first by the Australians and then by the English. So I think Afridi was on board. He wanted to make some changes and he wanted to play bold and exciting cricket. And I thought, OK, there's a series on. Uh, let's have an arrangement with him. He's a very busy man. But he did, did agree. He said, OK, I'll be the chairman of this selection committee because you need help right now. The public is demanding the, a different type of cricket and the existing setup is not giving them that. So that is why uh, we are now going to play not to win or lose, but we're going to play the game in the true spirit of the game. Constitution was approved. The 2014 Constitution was ordered by a judge of the Islamabad High Court that had thrown the previous administration out because A, the previous constitution was undemocratic and B, they'd been rigging in the elections in 2012-13. The then patron Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, obeying the court's orders, set up an interim committee led by me to bring in a new constitution and get it approved both by the ICC and by the Supreme Court of Pakistan, which we duly did. So in 2014, the 2014 constitution is a democratic constitution in which there are only two nominees, which is the Prime Minister's nominees to the board and eight other independent elected members of the board. Um, and they are the ones who then select the board. Um, so the fact is that this constitution was kicked out unceremoniously by the then Prime Minister in 2019, when he brought in the Australian system. And by a stroke of the pen, he abolished the democratic constitution approved by the ICC and by the Supreme Court, uh, and brought in this constitution which has played havoc with cricket in this country. There is not a single elected member in this constitution. There are two nominees of the prime minister, nominees, and there are five so-called independent members, handpicked by the chairman, who is a nominee of the prime minister. And it is this board that then goes on to elect the chairman. So there is not a single elected member in this, and it doesn't represent the, the vast majority of stakeholders uh, of cricket in this country. So the charge is completely ridiculous. Um, this is the same Prime Minister who used to say, Prime Ministers should not appoint chairman. Therefore, when he became Prime Minister, the first thing he did was he appointed the chairman and so on. And he not only appointed one chairman, he appointed two chairmen, one after the other. The first one was Hassan Mani, the second one was Ramiz Raja. So by a stroke of the pen, he's been playing fast and loose with the constitution, imposing his own writ on, on, on the PCB, which has led to ruination. And now that we restore the old democratic constitution back, he makes this feeble excuse. Look, it's not my job to make statements regarding India and Pakistan. I know two things. I've served five years in PCB, I've met everybody, known all the currents. The Indian BCCI will not take a decision that is opposed by their government. And by the same criterion, the Pakistani government will want to be part of the decision making between any games between India and Pakistan. Naturally, we would like India to come and play here. But if India refuses to come and, to come and play here, or if the ICC votes by a majority that they want to take the series somewhere else, then we have the option of either agreeing with that or going to our government and saying, OK, what do you want us to do? And since the patron is the patron, 
uh, and we do require security clearances and other clearances, then we'll just let the government decide what to do. Look, if the situation comes to this that India refuses to play in uh, Pakistan and we are obliged to decide whether we are going to pull out or whether we are going to play or in a different venue, then this question will come up. But it will come up after we take a decision. If we take the decision that we want to play India at all costs and, and not ruin this tournament because of bloody mindedness by India, political bloody mindedness by India, then we, in, you know, I've always said politics should not come into sport, but it does. And so therefore, that's unfortunate. And so therefore, we have options. You have just mentioned that uh, grounds are available in Australia. Uh, I think similarly is the case with, the, with London on the UK. And I think the Dubai Authority is also very keen. Uh, my sense is that any playing country, ICC playing member will want an India-Pakistan match on their turf. Because you can imagine the sort of huge broadcast and other pull that that exerts. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll think of this at that time. I'm going off to Dubai in the next uh, week or so. And I will expect that they, this is an issue they will raise with me. Uh, they've invited me to the opening ceremony of the, their league. And I'm going there. And I'm sure that some issues will come up. And we'll look into all this. Quetta and uh, Peshawar have been hotspots of some sort in the past. Uh, <clears throat> my sense is that if we can get the facilities ready, if the Bukti Stadium in Quetta can be got ready to international standards, if the stadium in Peshawar can be got ready to international standards, that then as far as I'm concerned, the ball is not in my court, but in that of the government. And the government obviously here includes the military authorities that finally end up providing the security. I've had a chat with the military authorities in Quetta. They are very keen that we should come and play there. Uh, and they have, right now they are in talks with the Balochistan government uh, to immediately upgrade the stadium in the next six weeks. If they're able to do that, and that's a big if, then we can consider going to Quetta for two matches. But if they can't do that, then there's no question of going there, right? But let's assume that they can do that. Then the question is, will they provide the security? And when security issues are concerned, it's not just the PCB, ICC, international players, the Quetta government, the co-commander in Quetta, but it's also the federal government. So a lot of stakeholders come into play. And if any one of them turns around and says, sorry, we can't guarantee security, foolproof security, then there's no go. So my argument has been, we are, we are going to try and get it ready. We're going to try and get the stadiums ready. If they are ready, then the ball's in the other court. If they give us a green light, we'll go there. But having said that, Quetta, is, it is possible that maybe in six weeks it might be up to hosting a, a match of international standard. If not, then we'll probably organize some exhibition matches there of low-key without foreign players just to keep the spirit of cricket alive and to make sure the stadium renovation continues apace. As far as Peshawar is concerned, I don't see any red lights except that of the stadium right now. Uh, the stadium is not ready and they are telling us it won't be ready for another six months. So as far as I'm concerned, there are no red lights for me. The only red lights are, exist for the government. They have to take responsibility. Uh, there were a lot of red lights uh, when we brought PSL back to Pakistan. There was a lot of terrorism going on. And uh, I was able to persuade the military and the government and the provincial government uh, to allow us to bring one match to Pakistan. This is the opening, the door. Uh, we, we, we were able to do that. And I think uh, uh, there is a feeling here that we need to be uh, uh, safe and secure, but we need to continue with our cricketing activities. That's something we haven't considered. There is a lot of talk about it. There is some public pressure also that uh, is critical of some decisions that have been taken on the field. Um, I'm not thinking about that right now. Right now I'm thinking about two things. I'm thinking about how the series will end safe, safely, peacefully, and with some good results and good cricket then we'll take this issue up at that stage. We'd be more than willing to go and help the Saudis put up a, a, a cricketing structure there if, if asked. We have the expertise, we have the talent, we have the knowledge. And if the Saudis want us to help them, we'll certainly do that.